Chapter Five of the House on the Downs by Gladys Edson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lady's Maid. After the guests departed, Sir Quentin and Mark went into the library to smoke and talk over old Oxford days. Eve, in some agitation, came in later. Quentin, she began with imperiousness, after a hasty little apology to Mark for the interruption. The last time I wished to dismiss Cynthia Melsom, you forbade me to do so. But now I really must insist that this woman goes. Sir Quentin looked gravely at his young wife. So that you may finally acquire that much-desired French maid, Eve? Eve's face became rebellious. Well, why shouldn't I have a French maid? All the women of my acquaintance have. Cynthia Melsom was always unsatisfactory and insolent, and now I have found her to be dishonest. Careful, Eve. Sir Quentin's voice grew somewhat stern. It is not right to accuse Cynthia of dishonesty unless you are very certain of your facts. Eve gave a little exasperated twitch to her shoulders. Mr. Brandon will naturally wonder, Quentin, why you take such an extraordinary interest in my maid and make yourself her champion. Mark flushed and hurriedly relit his pipe. Quentin was always an amazingly soft-hearted chap, bit of a modern Don Quixote. Sir Quentin smiled at Eve with indulgent affection. You see, my dear, Mr. Brandon insists upon taking a charitable view of my failings. Well, Mark, I'll explain my interest in my wife's maid, even though you are good enough to accept me on trust. You remember my father's old gamekeeper, Peter Melsom? Bit of a character he was, and faithful as they make them. Cynthia is his daughter, and only child. Perhaps you'll remember her, too. She was a long-legged little girl racing about with the dogs when we came down from Oxford on our vacations. I promised old Peter Melsom on his deathbed that there'd always be a place here at the Grange for Cynthia if she should ever come back to Rotherdean. You know, she ran away to London to seek her fortune there when she was about seventeen. I expect Peter kept too tight a rein on her. She was a high-spirited girl and something of a beauty, too. We lost all track of her for years, and old Peter, when he died, had no notion where she was. She turned up here at the Grange the day Eve and I were married, and I offered her the position of maid to Eve, a position which she was very glad to accept. I fancy her experiences in London had not been entirely happy ones. At any rate, she had learned to appreciate a comfortable home. She has not always shown her appreciation, said Eve tartly, and now she has committed a theft. What do you think she has taken? Sir Quentin asked forbearingly. It was evident that he believed Eve to be mistaken. The young wife flushed rather oddly. I think Melsom has taken the key to a little metal box in my dressing table drawer and means to wait her chance to open the box and ransack the contents, if she has not already done so. I found her examining the box a few days ago. She said by way of excuse that she was admiring the chasing on it. I always keep the key hidden in another drawer, and this afternoon I found that it was gone. It was Melsom's afternoon off, and she did not return until nearly nine o'clock this evening, according to Mrs. Carswell. She should have been back at six o'clock. I was obliged to have Cicely dress me for dinner. Sir Quentin still appeared unimpressed by Eve's accusation. Have you asked Cynthia about this key? Of course, and she denies having taken it. Naturally, she would. She was decidedly insolent about it, and said she was going to appeal to you to vindicate her character. I should think the only thing for you to do would be to give her a month's wages and dismiss her. I will not have her prying about and poking over my things. Sir Quentin shook his head. I should have to have more proof of Cynthia's dishonesty than you have yet given me. By the way, Eve, is there anything especially precious in this metal box? She swept back a loosened tress of her golden hair. There is nothing in it at all now. I took everything out as soon as I found the key was gone. But don't you see? If Melson will take one key, she will another, and nothing will be safe from her. You will probably find that you have simply mislaid the key, suggested Sir Quentin, with provoking optimism. Eve's blue eyes glittered angrily. I might have known it would be useless to appeal to you against this woman. My head aches, and I am going to bed. Good night, Mr. Brandon. I am sorry you had to hear all this. Just a minute, Eve, Sir Quentin said gently. Of course I shall question Cynthia and endeavor to get at the truth. But until I can go into this more thoroughly, I shall suspend my judgment, and I wish that you would try to do the same. You have not found your diamond bracelet yet? I see you are not wearing it this evening. The flush of anger receded from Eve's face leaving it colorless. There is another thing, Quentin, she said in a weary voice. I told you when I first missed the bracelet a few days ago, and you asked why I was not wearing it. 
that I suspected Melsom might have taken it. Oh, I can't believe that Peter Melsom's daughter is a thief. Sir Quentin went over to his young wife and, drawing her into his arms, kissed her on the forehead. Run up to bed, dear child, and get a good sleep. I'll try to straighten things out in the morning. Eve slipped from her husband's embrace. You might make Melsom give up the key, at least. I know she has it. Don't let Quentin keep you up too late, Mr. Brandon, she added with an uncertain little laugh. Time is nothing to him if he starts on the subject of gypsies. Sir Quentin looked after her with fond eyes. She is not quite herself tonight, Mark, nervous and upset over her bracelet. And now this key. Of course, they'll both turn up some day when she's given up searching for them. Cynthia Melsom is honest enough, although she is a bit independent for a lady's maid. I expect I shall have to give her something of a dressing down. Women are odd creatures, Mark. There's Eve apparently more fussed up over the loss of a key than she has been over her bracelet, and that was really valuable. What kind of bracelet was it, old chap? Mark asked sympathetically. Platinum, set with diamonds. I bought it for her only a week before she lost, or more likely, mislaid it. Mark gave a little start and puffed hard at his pipe. In his mind's eye, he saw again the bracelet that Inspector Haskett had taken from a pocket of Craddock Rayner's coat. That had been platinum, set with diamonds. Well, said Sir Quentin reminiscently, my marriage has been a remarkably happy one, taken all in all. I say remarkably because, of course, there is a great disparity in age between Eve and myself, and such marriages are often a failure. But I always try to remember that Eve is young and naturally loves life and youth about her, so I let her have her little fling, even if I am too staid to join in myself. There's time enough for her to settle down and be middle-aged. She can't be young but once, and I am glad when I know that she is enjoying herself. It is good for her having Fazenta and Rodney here. Sometimes I fancy there is a little friction between Eve and Fazenta, but she and the boy get on famously. Of course, at times they rag each other like brother and sister, but Eve can always bring him out of a blue funk when no one else can. He's temperamental, naturally, like most musicians. Mark puffed away at his pipe and said nothing. Sir Quentin looked across at his guest with kindly interest. How is it that you never married? Mark took a long, slow pull at his pipe. I did marry three years after I went out to Australia. I, uh, lost my wife two years later. Died? Old chap, I'm no end sorry. Mark removed the pipe from his mouth and knocked the bowl against the fender to empty the ashes. The fact is we're divorced. Couldn't hit it off. Mutual incompatibility. Oh, nothing sensational about it on either side. Just that she wanted a career, a chance to express her own individuality, and I was a young ass in those days and thought that the privilege of being my wife was career enough for any woman. I am sorry, said Sir Quentin again. Mark got up abruptly. Well, that's over and done with now. Think I'll go to bed, old man. I'm beastly sleepy. In the hall, as he was about to ascend the wide, curving staircase, a woman came quickly toward him from the shadowy spaces beyond. She was primly and somewhat coquettishly dressed in black with a small frilled cap and apron of spotless muslin. She was perhaps thirty-five or six, tall, well-shaped, distinctly good-looking, and seemed a woman who had had affairs in her time. There was the gleam of old fires in her brilliant eyes, traces of them about her lips, the sort of woman in whom secrets lie hidden. She seemed also one of those women who cannot look at a man without smiling. She was smiling at Mark now, and she addressed him in a soft, demure voice. "'You are Mr. Brandon, sir?' It amused Mark to return her smile. He assured her that he was Mr. Brandon and waited for her to state her business. Her smile became confidential. If you please, sir, I want to ask about the gentleman who was found dead in Rotherdean Hollow by you and Mr. Elphick, I understand. It is quite certain that he was Craddock Rayner, the leading man over at the Theatre Royal in Brighton. I think there is no doubt of it, said Mark, his wonderment growing. There were visiting cards found on him engraved with his name. The woman's lips tightened. This will make a good deal of a stir about here. Do you happen to know, Mr. Brandon, if there was anything else found on him, anything that might be considered a clue to who killed him? Mark came on his guard. I don't feel I am at liberty to say anything further about the matter. It will all come out at the inquest. Her eyes grew hard. No doubt a good many things will come out then, Mr. Brandon. Very probably they will, he agreed. And now, may I ask, you are Cynthia Melsom, are you not? I remember your father and you as a little girl playing about here. Her smile came into evidence again. You have a long memory, Mr. Brandon. I am Cynthia Melsom. Perhaps you think it a bit odd for me to be so curious about Craddock Rayner, 
but I'm interested in the stage and stage folk. I was in the theaters myself years ago, just souping, as they call it. I never got as far as a speaking part. Well, I'll not keep you any longer. Good night, Mr. Brandon. Her eyes quick and bright again, her voice soft and seductive. Good night, said Mark rather shortly. End of chapter 5